Mansour Khatib Ahmed Abdul Majid is my full name. Um, I have uh, about there's eight of us, um, four brothers, four sisters. Um, I grew up in uh, wow. I grew up in so many different places. We were poor, so we never could afford um, the rent. We always got evicted, so we moved from one place to the next place. I lived all over New Jersey, but I can't really tell you one specific place. It wasn't only, I mean, it was maybe until I got, um, I think we were 13 or 14 years old until we, my father found a good job and we got settled, so to speak. Um, but my, my, my father was seeking Islam before I was even born. He became Muslim previous, before I was even um, born. So I was, I was born in, um, I was, I used to for Islam. I was born into Islam, into Islamic household. But, um, and my father went, for the first five years of my life, I was in Saudi Arabia. From the womb, my father traveled and went to Saudi Arabia to go study. And um, from there, he went to Egypt and different other different um, countries until uh, my mom, he, he decided he couldn't find a, a proper school. So he decided to go back to America and, and um, just work and try to find Islam within America. Because at the time when he was uh, studying, for, looking for Islam, they had that uh, whole black Islam, nation of Islam thing going, and he wanted to f find a difference between the real Islam between what was um, being practiced here in America. So he left the country to find it. And um, so like maybe the first five, six years of my life, I, was, I wasn't even in America, actually. Um, I came back to America maybe around six or seven years old. And as far as I can remember, I just, I just remember us moving from place to place until for the first six or seven years of my, my stay here in America. Um, we could never really find a, it was always getting evicted. It was always living with people. Always living with my family, you know, because my father couldn't find a, a good job that could afford to rent. So um, we were very poor, but we were very happy. Like I said, there was eight of us. Um, my father, five of us were, um, were together, and, five, and three were from my father's previous marriage. Mm. But um, and um, but we all got along. I mean, there was never an issue with that. Um, we lived in a happy household. I grew up under. I grew up as a, my father trained us to be Muslims. I mean, we learned a lot at an early age. We didn't understand what we were saying, the words, because uh, my mother spoke Spanish, my mother's from, Pan from Panama, and my father was learning Arabic. Like I said, my father, uh, he, he tried to teach us Islam at a very early age. He was stern, I and mean, he was always tired. I remember him always being tired from working all the time. But even though he was tired and grumpy, he still played with us. Um, he was like my, like I say, he was my hero um, because of that, because he was big and strong, but yet he was very kind. Um, my mother was really the one who was with us all the time because my father was always working. Um, I remember her being, she was very passionate. Uh, I, I believe she embraced Islam before my father did. I think she was Muslim before my father was. Um, she was very, um, very protective, very, uh, very passionate, very emotional. Um, and very protective of her children. I mean, she was a good mom. I mean, she passed away about 10 years ago, but um, uh, so I don't like speaking of her much because of that. Uh, but um, she was, she was uh, I remember I was, I was a mama's boy for, the, for the, when, during my early ages. And then after a while I became, uh, my father took me out and I would go study with him. And then him and I, we had a relationship because like I said, he was always at work. But um, I mean, that's pretty much what I can remember about my, my family, my life. I remember we were poor, but we were very happy. I was a, I was a recluse. Um, I remember me going to high school and <laughs> always feeling out of place because I was all right, in, in, in the household, you're preaching Islam, and not just Islam, but the Salafi Wahhabi Islam. You know, everything is haram, you know, everything, you can't do anything, pretty much everything's a sin, everything's bitter. So, I would go to high school and in high school everything was so open and so free. I remember always feeling guilty and always feeling bad that I couldn't, you know, and I, I remember one time actually me thinking about, actually thinking about becoming a Christian, to be honest with you. I just wanted to, I always wanted to fit in and I never could. Uh, I remember uh, all my, all the, I remember being isolated, really, uh, when I felt so bad and so out of place that during lunch period, I would have lunch in a library because I got really good friends with a librarian because I felt so uncomfortable being around other kids because I had nothing to talk about. We had nothing in common. I didn't listen to music. I didn't, I didn't listen to music. I didn't listen to, um, I, didn't do th I didn't go to no parties. 
I remember uh, even like it's trying to play sports, you know, because there were cheerleaders involved. I couldn't do that. So I, I remember feeling out of place all the time, feeling awkward. I was very, very quiet. And so my best friends were really my brothers and my father because they were the only ones I could really identify with what I was going through. But I remember once when I was 15 years old, I went through all of Sahih Bukhari. My father had volumes of the books and I went through all of them on my own. No, uh, I remember now. He gave me this book called, uh, like, I forgot the name of the book, but it was about what happens when you die. And that scared the bejesus out of me. I was petrified to death. And I wanted to know, okay, how can I avoid this terrible place called hell that's coming for those of us who, because everything's a sin and I'm committing all these sins. So what in the world can I do to prevent myself from going to this terrible place? And so I started going through all of the, the volumes of Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, according from the Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And, um, and through reading, is when I became interested in Islam. It was through reading the hadiths is when I started getting like, you know, seeing that, you know, like for every one good deed, Allah rewards you 10 times and seeing that, okay, Allah is merciful, he's not this angry God. Because initially before then, I was, I, was, I was doing everything out of fear. It wasn't until I started reading Bukhari and Muslim, um, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, where I just started to see, well, you know, the Prophet was a kind person and, you know, Allah gives you chances. He's not as, he's not as angry as, it, as the Salafis will make it seem. And so it was through reading the, um, the, the Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim where I started to get a bit more understanding of the deen and I really got interested in it. I mean, I remember uh, my father would, would uh, get lessons at home. He had a friend called Sheikh Ahmed. I don't remember, I don't remember his last. All I remember, his face was beautiful. He was, he was half of Quran. He had like this glow on his face. Um, he would always come, come to the house um, at around eight o'clock at night and he would teach my father whatever lessons, but I was, I was forbidden to go into the, the room. They were learning from this, I forgot the book they were learning from, but I remember he always came in, he was always, he was a mechanic or something of that nature because I saw his uniform, but his, he had a great knowledge of Islam according from, from the, Wahhab, um, the Wahhab Salafi sect. And it seemed like he, even though he was a mechanic, his mission in life was to spread Islam. Like he just did this to make money, but his passion was the religion. And I remember me looking at him and thinking, wow, I can't, I will know, inshallah, when I, when I get older, I want to be like that. Like, I don't care if what, what I do to make money to put a roof over my head, but I want to be like, because see me, he reminded me of the prophet because he was always smiling. He was very pleasant. He had a beautiful, he had a nur on his face, like a glow on his face, because he was always reciting Quran. And I remember me thinking, man, when I get older, I want to be like him. I don't care what I have to do to make money. I'm not, I'm not big on making money. I'm not money hungry, but I want my mission to be the mission of spreading Islam. So um, I remember um, that was my, like, my, my, that's when I started feeling more comfortable and started to really enjoy the religion, not do it and do it out of love and out of uh, a general concern and interest for it and for the spread of it and for the growth of it and for and teaching others. So, you know, in order to teach others, you have to first teach yourself. So around 15 years old is when I started becoming more um, aggressive in my, in my quest for knowledge of Islam. Between 15 and 24 years old, I started studying with his brother. My father uh, found his, I don't know how he finds all these people, but he found his other brothers willing to teach us for free. Um, his name is Sheikh Abdul Razak Hijab. That was his name, Sheikh, I just, I recalled um, earlier today. Um, I remember what, whatever we would learn in the, in this, in the we, we would go to this mosque that would teach us as well as we would go to Mixalat there. And I remember whatever they taught us there, Sheikh Abdul Razak Hijab, he would, he would make it seem like whatever we was learning there wasn't the whole truth. It was like 50% the truth, but not the, like maybe they got the facts right, but the, the reason behind it didn't apply to today's world. So we don't really have to follow it like Mia for Mia or, or you know, point for point. So I remember that's when I started thinking, well, I got to get out of here because I don't know what's, the, what's, what's real, what's not. Is it what Sheikh, I thought it was what Sheikh Abraham Hidab was saying because it was, it was more logical. You know, you know, like the, the, the whole thing about the wearing anything below the ankles is in the hellfire. You know, the reason that he, well, he said why the prophet was make a comment like that was to take a, a big problem from the Arabs at that time and make it and say one comment and make it simple so they could stop doing it. You know, their, their clothes walking, the, the arrogance of their having long clothes and the feces uh, that catches because they walk on the grounds that has like the feces of the sheep and the cows and the things of that nature. So when they go make salat that the salat is bottled because of the nedges on their, on their clothes, he would make one line to clear two problems up. 
And I was like, well, that makes perfect sense. Islam is easy, he, it, it's, it's, but it's not as rigid as they make it seem. So around, from 1524, when I was studying with him, he would teach us uh, like the Arabic and he would, we would hafiz Quran with him. From, from 15 to about 23, because um, he, went, he went away to Egypt, um, at first I wanted to go to Al-Azhar, because uh, he was Egyptian, he would always claim Al-Azhar was like the greatest school for if you want to learn Islam. But when he went away, I had no connections with Allah. I didn't, I didn't even know how, like, who do I write? Who do I call? You know, this was before computers was like really big. So like, where, how do I get in contact with anyone over there? And my, my father's best friend, um, Shwaib, was in Syria at the time. He was working for the American Language Center in Syria. And he said that there's a school called uh, Jamir Abu, Abu Nur in Syria, in Damascus, and I could study there. So um, what I did was I worked two jobs, uh, two security jobs, and I saved my money and enough money so that when I went over there, I have enough money for maybe me to stay over there maybe two to three years. And that's when I decided to go, and that's why I wanted to go. It's mandatory. I mean, I was, I was getting Arabic lessons there, and I was getting lessons on, on how to make salat and things of that nature, basic fiqh. But um, when I would go to my other classes from Sheikh Abdul Razak Higab, it was a private lesson, just a father. He was basically doing a favor for the family because he liked us. Um, he would explain things that they couldn't explain. And when I would go back there thinking that, okay, I'm gonna school these guys now, I'm gonna let them know what they don't, what they refuse to tell us, and why won't they just tell us these things to make, make it sound easy? They would tell us that, um, they, would, they would get even angrier and just shoot me down and tell me that, ask me like, who said this? Like, who gave him the permission to say these things to you? This don't make no sense. Like, did this come from Quran? Did this come from Hadith? And the things he was saying was logical. It made logical sense, but because I didn't have enough, I mean, I couldn't tell them the, the verse of Quran that this came from, or I could tell them like the use of logic and the, the use of logic is needed in Islam. I, I couldn't come to these, come with any of these um, um, rebuttals. They, uh, they shot me down and told me that I don't know any better, and it's best for me. Um, they would invite Sheikh Abdul Rajah Higab over to come and, and speak with him, but uh, it never happened because he said that it's. He said he knows these people, what kind of people these are, and it's pointless me going over that would just cause an argument. There would be no, they would come to no understanding. They were all older than me. They were all men. I was probably the youngest one there, easy. Um, I would go there only because my father, my father would go to, um, was studying there as well. Um, there were, a lot of these people were, most of them I would have to say were, they came out of jail. A lot of them were streets. It was like in, it was like in a neighborhood, like in a, in a poor neighborhood. So it was, uh, it was a lot of poor brothers that were, they probably, they, they embrace Islam through, through jail, you know, after talking to them. And, um, and me being born into Islam, I had a different attitude altogether. Some of us came from the streets, some of them were ex-gang members. A lot of them embraced Islam through jail. And um, I think that th some of the companions they tried to imitate were the ones that had the more of aggressive personalities. And um, me being born into Islam and not coming from that type of a background, um, I, I always identify mostly with the Prophet Muhammad. You know, um, there was a hadith about him and his neighbor that always used to throw garbage on him and curse at him. And, and once when he came back, he saw that that neighbor wasn't there to um, harass him anymore. And he went and checked on him, checked on her to see if she was okay. And that hadith uh, was what, what, what personified to me the essence of who the Prophet was. He was a person of compassion and mercy and not so much of uh, aggression and challenging people and being authoritative and just, you know, just pushing his will on others. And so that was my biggest difference with them is that, you know, I tried to, I thought that this was the, the personality we should have and they, and they attached themselves more to the more aggressive companions. And this was my issue with them. This is why we can never see eye to eye, uh, why I always felt uncomfortable with that um, form, of, that method of thinking and that philosophy and that whole, you know, everything is haram and everything is, you know, it made Islam seem so difficult and so hard, especially living in the Western world, where you live with other people who don't necessarily believe as you believe and probably do a lot worse than what happened during the time of the Prophet, you know, and they think less of you. So instead of being aggressive and being very um, bold towards others, I've always wanted to be more uh, compassionate and, and calm. So. Uh, that was my biggest issue regarding some of my other classmates. I was driven mostly by the, by the differences between, all right, I, I, you have two people from the same 
school of thought, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah telling me two different things. That was part of it. Another part of it was I just wanted to be in the Muslim world. I, I, you, you understand that at that time I was just surrounded by American born Muslims. I never really experienced many, you know, foreign Muslims or, or Arab Muslims or African Muslims, you know. Anyone other than like the black Muslims, I, I really didn't have any experience with. So I just wanted to go in. I wanted to, um, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to study. I wanted to, um, you know, just experience what life was outside of America. Because I thought Amer America was very so difficult to live in America. I thought maybe it might be easier to live and be a Muslim, be a practicing Muslim outside of America, where you could hear the Aydhan being called five times a day, where you don't have to search, you know, for a mosque because it's like three around the vicinity. So you know, whichever one is closest is one you can go to, um, where women wear hijab. <laughs> where, where everyone practiced Islamic adab, and uh, it was a big shock when I, came away. <laughs> when I landed. Man, I, my eyes was open. I, I thought, you know, I, I was under the impression that you know there were angels over there. Really, um, just to be honest with you. And when I got over there, it was a big. I was in in for a rude awakening, but um, the knowledge was there, and that was probably most important. Was that what I what I found out and the information that I got when I arrived in Syria was. Uh, probably the most important thing for me. I'm in school, I'm a Jama Damask, um, but I have maybe, I, I arrived there during the summertime when they have a break. So school hasn't started yet. I don't know, I know maybe the Arabic alphabet and how to say salam alaikum, but other than that, I can't carry on a conversation. Um, we lived in um, Sayyidah Zainab with uh, two other Sudani brothers. Uh, we shared the rent. Um, my uncle, well, my father's friend, Shwaib, he had a friend called Sayyid Musawi that lived maybe a couple of blocks away from where we, where we was living at. And he had some sons that could speak perfect English. He told me they were from London or something like that, the UK. So I was able to find some people that I could actually have a conversation with. Because other than them, like really, there was really nobody else. So um, I had no idea if they were Shia at the time, to be honest with you. I just knew that they were just good Muslim brothers that can speak English and, you know, they have a way to uh, communicate with me. So I went over there and the first day, you know, it was just a typical day. It's like visiting a friend. You know, I, I spent most of the time with their sons. Uh, we talked about America. We talked about London. We talked about our past. We talked about why I'm there. Um, they never, not once did they attack me or, or say, you know, I'm wrong because I'm a Sunni or anything of that nature. They were just very friendly very hospitable um, and very, uh, very welcoming. So, and, and it felt good to actually to speak to someone that spoke English. <laughs> so for a couple, you know, for a couple of weeks, man, I was like, man, I'm ready to go home. Because when I got there, it was a, really, it was a rude awakening. I, I, can, I had no one there no, and I had no family. I had, other than my father's friend who I, who I he was, you know, like what, 20, 30 years older than me. So there was like really no, they really know someone that on my level that could understand me or you know I could communicate with. So when I went over there, it was just nice just to talk to somebody around my age that had this you know same interest that I had and that you know they could understand what I what I was going through. But um, I think maybe after the the first day, the second day, I I, I spent time with their dad, Sayyid Musawi, and I remember we were making salat, and he saw me pray um, with my hands folded the 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 Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'at way, and he um, he asked me when the salat was over, he uh, he gestured me for, to come to him, and um, I remember he's sitting down, and he looked at me in the eyes and he said, um, "Why do I pray that way?" I said, "Because that's the way the Prophet prayed." <laughs> that was my answer. That's why the Prophet prayed, and he said, "If I could show you some authentic hadiths of how the Prophet prayed." Would you change your style of praying? I said, well, I said, that sounds good. I, don't, I, can, I can't think of anything better than what I've lear already learned, but it's okay. I was willing to accept any new, new information and compare it to what I already had. So he says, all right, tomorrow when you come back, I will, I will show you some of these hadiths of how the prophet prayed. So the next day I come back, he has these books on, on, on the side of him, sitting in pretty much the same spot he was sitting before, and he said, uh, he opened a book and he started reading some of the hadiths about how the prophet prayed. And, and the thing that got me wasn't the style of how he prayed. I mean, it was who said how he prayed has got me because, you know, coming from um, the Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'at, 
uh, school when you have a lot of hadiths from you know Aisha and, and Prophet's companions. It was I never heard many hadiths where the Prophet's family members, his own daughter, no less. And I think the ones from Fatima Zahra, alayhi was what got me the most because that was his own daughter. I mean that that came from him, and and she would say like my father. You know, I never heard that before. It, it like it. You gotta understand, it's like coming from a from a system where you don't, you rarely hear of them, you, you never hear of them. Period. I mean, other than making salat, where you have to salam them, you, where you don't hear about the Prophet Muhammad's family, they actually, actually they actually hear the Prophet Muhammad's own daughter speak of her father. It hit me home because I was I would always think I'm a logical thinker, and I would always think, well, who knows my father better than me? You know, I have his mannerisms, I have his ways, I even think like he does. You know, we even cut our hair. You know, on the same day, we don't even know it. I, I cut my hair, he cut his hair. I'm like, oh, you cut your hair? I cut my hair too, you know? So like, we like attached, like spiritually, we're attached. So I was thinking like, who would know the Prophet Muhammad better than his own daughter? And that's, and she's the one who got me with him. She, when she said, my father. And then you, know, you get other hadiths from, you know, Imam Ali or Hassan Hussein. And, and that really hit me hard because I knew that they prayed different. I know they had a different ideology. But I didn't know, I didn't have, other than how to mix a lot, I didn't have no other information other than, you know, some of the rumors that, that I, I heard when I was in America about, you know, what the Shias believe. So that night I said, okay. So I started praying like they pray. The kanut, the, the praying on the, the torba and everything. I felt really, I was scared. I mean, when I got home that night, I, I cried. And then my uncle looked at me and he said to me, well, um, Shuaib looked at me and he said, um, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's tough, huh? It's, it can be scary, huh? I said, yeah, because I was thinking, man, if I become, if I pray like them, like, I, I knew, like, I knew automatically that, all right, this is, this got to be correct. I mean, the only difference is who you get, who you get the information from, this person or this person. Who, who's, who knows this man, the prophet, the prophet of Allah, better, you know? And, and I was scared because I knew they were right. I knew it. I just wasn't willing to accept everything yet. So I cried, and the next day I, I would come and I would question him about some of the things that I've heard in America about, you know, did, uh, did a Prophet Muhammad, did, was, was he the one supposed to get the, the Risala or was it supposed to go to Ali? Um, is Ali God or is he just, like, what is position does he hold? Um, you know, what's the position, what's, what's your opinion of some of the companions and things of this nature? And he always, he always um, answered me calmly, um, Totally, uh, he would blow me away with some of his wisdom. I thought it was from him. It was only until like maybe years later when I was through my own studies. Wow, he was just, just paraphrasing Imam Ali. I'm like, but his wisdom was like, boom. It was like so amazing. I was so impressed by him. So, so impressed by him. And, but he, he was never offensive. He was never aggressive. He never mentioned any names. He never slammed or, or, or slandered any of the companions. All he did was just mention the, 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 uh, the character traits of the prophet and how his family were the ones that had it more than anyone else. So it, he came from a position of love, which is what I really appreciated about him. And that endeared me to some of the, read some of the, uh, the lives of some of the imams. Um, and the first one I fell in love with was Imam Zain Abidin because of, I, I mean, I, I never even heard of anyone that prayed like a thousand rakats in the 24 hours. That was like, so I was so like blown by that and how his, um, his own slaves never wanted to leave him. They, they would rather like perish at his feet than be sold than be freed. So, um, and, and the, the concept of Irfan was like totally new to me. I never even heard of that before. So I was really blown away by the knowledge and the wisdom and the mannerism of them and how they, they were the ones that were truly, they, they continued the line, they continued the, the, the traits of the prophet. And that's what that got, uh, that really impressed me, what made me want to change. And I remember um, I decided, I said, okay, I'm going to change now. I'm going to, I'm going to go full out. I'm going to say I'm a Shia and everything, you know. Um, I'm even going to take my shahada over again, but I wanted my father's permission first. <laughs> so I remember going um, to the to the Maktab Hatif, and I remember me being calling my father, and I was shaking in my boots. I was like, "Oh man, I hope he don't disown me. I hope he don't think less of me. I hope I don't disappoint him." And uh, when he called, he he just gave me the vote of confidence. He said, "You have to do what's right for you, and you know, just trust your own judgment." And when he said that, like I calmed down because I knew I was right. I just didn't want my father, I just want to disappoint my dad. So when he gave me that vote of confidence, I calmed down and I, I went full flesh. That's, after that, I could, you could tell me anything about anything, but so long as it was correct, I didn't care. I didn't care if it hurt my feelings, you know. 
because um, at that time, uh, but when I was Sunni, I wanted to be like uh, Abu Bakr. And now from changed from wanting to be like Abu Bakr to wanting to be like one of the Imams, you know, I felt well, like sacrilegious back then, but now it's, I know it's the correct way to go. It, the, the whole thing lasted, um, for me, changing the way I prayed, for me, like just diving into some of the knowledge of the, the knowledge of the Imams and uh, what they went through in different wars that Imam Ali fought took about uh, maybe a month. So like it, by the time school started, I was like two months away. So by the time school started, I went to um, Damascus, uh, uh, Jamit Abu Nord. So I decided I changed and I went to Damascus University for a section for foreigners for Arabic. And I started studying at the Hausa that uh, actually Sayyid Musawi, uh, he was a, uh, the founder of, um, from my initial uh, interest into Syria. And a year and a half later when he came, I would, we would like, I would call him and he would ask me different questions and things of that nature. Uh, he was just, just open-minded, he was willing to listen. Uh, I think he trusted me because he knew I was serious about my religion. I wouldn't change if it wasn't something worth changing. You know, if it wasn't better, I wouldn't change it. You know, if it wasn't more truth to it. So when he came over, um, he was very, uh, he came, came to my house, and I remember we were sitting in Tadalman, and uh, he saw me make Salat. And after making Salat, he said, oh, okay, so is that how you pray now? I said, yeah. I said, because you're praying wrong. That's what I told him. And he laughed. Uh, he didn't take offense to anything I said. And he, actually, that night, he changed the way he prayed. I, he, was a, he was already willing to change before he even heard the information, because he knew that, he, I mean, he, knew, he knows me. He knows how I am. But when it comes to my religion, I don't play around with it. I'm, I'm very serious. So he, he knew that there was something to it. And it wasn't until um, Musawi's, say Musawi's son, Ahmed, came by and visited. I think he just, I don't know if he came to visit me, he came to visit my father and say hello. But I remember um, he, that same day he would come and he visited and he sat down and he gave a wonderful explanation of why we pray the way we pray, why we do kunut. I mean, he really, he, I couldn't, I don't think I could ever say how eloquently he spoke to my father. It really was like Allah planned it. It really it was beautiful. Um, and he said in a way that my father can understand that, wow, this, this makes sense, this is logical. Um, I mean, I, mean I, I can't explain all the details, but it was, uh, it was very profound. I remember my father being very impressed with him. And I'm thinking back, because like, me and Ahmed would hang out. You know, I would go to his house and we would talk and joke and laugh and stuff. I never saw this part of him before. This religious, like profound, scholarly type. I'm like, who is this guy? I didn't know this guy. You know, he never showed me that side of him. Um, but he was like that with my father. And uh, my father, after that, my father was willing, was willing to accept any new information he got. And uh, he took it slowly. But just like me, the first thing he did was he prayed differently because he said that even if, even if um, this Ahl al-Sunnah with Jama'ah is also correct, but the, the Prophet's family also got to be correct too. Like both are correct, so not, no, no one is wrong, even if, even if he changed. So he felt that there was no danger in changing. And it wasn't until he started studying himself where he decided to um, go, you know, just, just say that he was a Shia and, and, and totally submerge himself in the faith. Knowledge, it was the people, you know, it was the people that, you know, when, you know, it's a shame, but we have like the best religion, but some of the worst practice from uh, uh, followers, I should say, um, the best knowledge. But it, was, it wasn't really the knowledge or the Ahl al-Bayt, it was just the lack of people following him. And I was, uh, I was in a town with all of this ulama, and I felt out of place, even in a Muslim country, I felt out of place, and I didn't feel, and I feel, didn't feel welcome. Um, and that's what probably got me to more than anything. But I never once blamed Islam, or blamed the law, or blamed the imams, you know. I, I've always like said, well, you know, I wish people would just practice more, was really the issue. And that's when I realized that, you know, people are people no matter where you go. In America, I felt out of place. Here I am in a Muslim country, with all of these Shias, and all these Muslims, and all these, uh, you know, you. One Adhan is going off, and then five minutes later, another Adhan is going off. You know, I'm thinking, wow, you know, you, you would think that I would be fit right at home there. But I felt every bit as out of place as there, as I was there, than I was when I was in America. But it was just for different reasons, you know. But um, I never once questioned the faith or felt uncomfortable or felt that I was doing the wrong thing. Three and a half years, I studied maybe a year and a half um, because of the difficulties I had with the culture and dealing with the people and just being, you know, just, just life in general, really. Um, and also, I, I was dealing with the money issues, ran out of money. I mean, I could tell you stories about <laughs> like how we, how we, it truly was a blessing um, sometimes how we even made it some months. Um, so 
it was because I saved three and a half years and after that I decided to go home because I ran out of money and I couldn't afford to, to um, be in Syria any longer. You know, you gotta work extra hard just to maintain, just to, just to keep your head above water. Everything's expensive, way expensive, and it was more expensive because I was there three years ago and inflation and everything, prices went up. So when I came back, I was surprised by how much things got, you know, gas prices and everything else was up. It's been three years, three and a half years. So when I came back, man, I had to work twice as hard just not even to save, just to not, and then when I got back, like my family broke up, everybody was older, everybody moved out, some people went to school. Um, and so there was like, and I, I had no real, real place to call home anymore. So I had to live on my own and just working just to just keep myself above water. Uh, me living alone in the West, um, uh, it made me, it strengthened me in a way and also it weakened me in a way. I mean, you do get affected with, when you're, when you're surrounded by non-Muslims and all you see is, you know, their, their way of doing things and their way of thinking, it can weaken your, it can weaken your manners, your akhlaq can get weakened. But in, in the same, but in another way, it also strengthened me is because I didn't want to lose everything. So I didn't want to lose Salat, I didn't want to lose Siyam, I didn't want to lose Zakat, I didn't want to lose these things. So it would uh, force me to study, even though I was working so much, that by the time you go home, you know, all you want to do is like sit in front of the boob tube and, and let it watch you while you fall asleep. But still, it gave me the strength to, um, you know, maybe read an ayat or read a book or try to further some education in, as far as Islam, Islam goes. But um, it, it did affect me. I mean, I remember, um, I remember once when I was at work, um, I was, uh, it was time for me to make salat. And my, my boss let, um, let me go to the back room and, and make my prayer. And when I came out, the, one of my coworkers, who I never knew before was Muslim, um, he, you know, he, he, he took, he uh, snuck his head in the door and saw me make, saw me in sujda. And when he came out, he realized I was Muslim. And I remember me walking up to him and he just pointed at me saying, that's a real Muslim. And I never, all this time, I never knew he was Muslim, you know, but so it did, I mean, it does, it does affect you. I mean, at that point I realized, wow, you know, it's alhamdulillah that, you know, I, I didn't lose everything to the point where someone that can recognize what a Muslim is, um, can actually see that I'm, I'm still practicing. So it made me feel good that he actually recognized me, but um, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't recommend people to do this. I mean, I did, I, I did miss being in the community. I did miss hearing the Aydan. I did miss hearing, you know, being able to go to a majlis on a Wednesday night instead of going to a khutbah on Fridays, you know. I did miss these things. Um, but it, 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 it strengthened me knowing that I could still persevere on my own. Because of the, because of the internet and the, um, the computer um, and YouTube, you can um, YouTube a majlis all day long. I mean, you know, have a whole majlis from Amar Naqshwani to Hassanin Rajab Ali back to back for like, you know, six hours just listen to, listen to lectures. So, you know, that thing in this day and age, I don't think, even if you're alone, I don't think you, as long as you have the internet, I don't think you're ever going to be, you know, away from uh, examples and beautiful stories to, uh, to refresh you and to um, re um, revitalize you and strengthen your faith. You know, thank God for the internet. For 10 years, working two jobs for 10 years, sometimes even three jobs. Two jobs, two full-time and a, a part-time job. After doing that for maybe 10 years, um, my father gave me a, a call and said that there was a house that they were starting up in Orlando and that if I wanted to, I could come up here and start studying and pursue my, my uh, education in Islam again. And it appealed to me because one, I was living in a Catholic, uh, Islamic, Salafi type environment so I really didn't have any, um, you know, any friends to speak of, or I, you know, I wasn't losing much if I decided to leave. So uh, I decided to come to Orlando when I decided to study with under Molana Beg and in uh, uh, Imam Ali Seminary. Am I okay? Yeah. In Imam Ali Seminary, and uh, just from to further my uh, pursuit of knowledge of Islam. Um, inshallah, the plan is to uh, study here for two years and then go overseas to Qom and study in Iran, or if that don't work, study in Iraq. And uh, just, you know, just, just, just do what I always dreamed when I was a child, really. I, I said before when I was a child that I don't care what it was that I did to, to feed myself. You know, I'm not money hungry. Oh, I never was money hungry. I never had it to begin with. But so long as I can take care of myself and take care of, uh, you know, if I'm married, take care of my wife. But my real job, my real passion is to spread the religion and spread Islam. So, so long as I can do that, I, I would love, 
I mean, I saw some of my curriculum that I'm going to have over there in Qom, and it's, my mouth is watering. I do believe that um, whenever I'm feeling down or feeling depressed, I always, always um, go back to the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt and take advice from them. That's pretty much all I have.